Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, you are here for the Foreign Language and Area Studies FLAS Fellowship Info Session. And uh, our agenda for today, we'll start with introductions. We'll go over the an overview of the FLAS Awards and then some specifics about the Academic Year Awards, specifics about the Summer Awards, and time for questions. And, inform and some final notes, feel free to add your questions to the chat as we go. Um, and this is being recorded, so if you're missing something, if you miss something, you can reach out to us and we will send it to you and we'll post it on the YouTube channel for the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies and maybe other centers will post it as well. We'll see how that goes. Um, I'm gonna start with introductions and um, I want to ask all the participants to please put your name in the chat and the language you're interested in studying um, and the world area you're interested in studying so we have a sense of who's here and what you're what you're looking for. And while you're all doing that, I'll introduce myself and then I'll pass it to my colleagues, Julia Bird. I'm the vice chair at the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies, and I will start the overview of this and then i'll hand it over to my colleague tomas who's our floss coordinator for most of the languages um, that floss touches tomas i always forget to unmute myself uh, my name is tomas lane and i'm uh, a program coordinator with global international and area studies which is a sort of umbrella group over several of our area studies on campus, although not all of them. And uh, my job is really to help facilitate the FLOSS uh, awards and the award process uh, for a couple of centers that are here today. Um, I guess since it's not very easy to uh, rotate between people, maybe I'll just go to Dylan, who's next on our screen, who... Uh, you've got to unmute yourself, too. <laughs> Hi, uh, Dylan Davis. I'm Associate Director at the Institute of East Asian Studies. Um, we're also an umbrella unit. Uh, and the languages we cover at East, for East Asia are uh, Mandarin, Chinese, Cantonese, Japanese, Korean, Mongolian, and Tibetan. So nice to see everybody. Um, do you, the other center, maybe Akasemi, do you want to go next? Hi, everyone. My name is Akasemi Newsom, and I'm the Associate Director of the Institute of European Studies, and we cover 18 West European languages with our FLOSS. Just going alphabetically, maybe Anirban, you can go next. Hi, I'm Anirban. I'm the Associate Director of the Institute for South Asia Studies, and somewhat new to this process, so learning with everyone else. I think that just leaves Jeff. Uh, my name is Jeff Pennington. I'm the executive director of the Institute of Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies. So we wanted to introduce ourselves because um, many of your questions can be directed to us uh, as you decide what program you're interested in doing. And eat, sometimes different centers have different guidelines or policies. So. There's a chance you'll be talking with us and we look forward to your questions. Um, okay, what is the FLAS Fellowship? It's a fellowship funded by the US Department of Education. A grant is actually given to the different centers at UC Berkeley and then the centers decide um, which students they go towards. So it's not directly from the government. And the goal is to promote the study of critical and less commonly taught global languages in combination with area studies, international studies, and international aspects of professional studies. There's two separate competitions, and you can apply for both at once, so think about if that's the right choice for you. Academic year, for next academic year, you can do language study, which is the more well-known typical uh, avenue to enroll in a language course and an area studies course, and you have to do one of each per semester. You, some centers also offer dissertation research or dissertation writing fellowships, so if you're interested in that, you can reach out to the individual center that it would be through. And then you can apply for summer funding to study a language, either at Berkeley, at another school in the U.S., or abroad. 
And here again are the world areas that offer Floss Fellowships at Berkeley. Um, I'm not going to read them all, but you can take a look there and you can see the center that organizes that fellowship. And please note that students need to apply to study a living language. That's what they're called. So languages like ancient Greek, classical Chinese are generally not eligible. And if you have questions about that, let us know. I want to share a note on studying African languages because they're not in the previous list. Um, they did not receive the grant this for this cycle. So there's currently no FLOSS funding for African languages, but the languages are available through other FLOSS institutions. Um, whoops, possibly. So we'll, the Center for African Studies will put up a link on their website soon um, to link to that those programs. And if you're interested, you can reach out to Martha whose email address is there and easy to remember. She's the first Martha at Berkeley, apparently. Um, if I can make just a small clarification, mm -hmm. just in case it wasn't clear, in order to get a FLOSS award at Berkeley, you do have to apply for a language that's covered by one of the area study centers that currently has a program. So for example, I saw somebody in the chat had proposed a native uh, American as in United States language, and those are not uh, covered by FLOSS. Likewise, any languages from other world regions that don't have an affiliated centers, it would need to do some exceptional work in order to see if we could get that to fit in under another program. Oceania is the one that comes to mind. We don't have a program that would cover any Oceania languages. Maybe Asia would if you could <laughs> convince them. Yeah, thank you. And we'll show a list of the approved languages soon. Uh, who is eligible, enrolled, and in incoming students, graduate, and I think in most cases, undergraduate students. Um, if you're an undergraduate student, uh, you should confirm that you're eligible, but I think in most centers do make awards to undergraduate students. Citizens, nationals, or permanent residents of the U.S., and that is because it's a grant from the U.S. government, and that is their decision for how they want to limit it. Students from any academic or degree program. If you're doing the academic year floss, you do have to be able to put an area studies course in your schedule. And so some programs, some academic programs, that's more tricky to figure out um, the time to do that. But um, any student is eligible. And students who have received the award previously are still eligible. So you can apply multiple years, receive it multiple years. Students prepared to study the language at the intermediate or advanced level. Tomas, I'm just realizing that I don't think this is the version of the PowerPoint that you had updated. Because I like me... added something here. Uh, no, I don't think it was on this slide. Okay, great. Well, you can just say it when it's okay. time. Um, there's certain in instances when you can apply to study a FLOSS, uh, to, you can receive a FLOSS to study a beginning level language. And in that case, you should reach out to the center that you want or to Tomas um, to ask about it. In general, if you already speak a language of that region at an intermediate or advanced level, you may be eligible to study a beginning level. The reason for this is the Department of Education really wants this award to be used for students to become fluent and be able to use the languages and oh, an award to study a beginning level language doesn't achieve that goal. So if you already are at an intermediate or advanced level, they might be, you can still sort of fit within their objectives. The application process, there's a page, it's hosted through the Graduate Division website. So here's the link. Um, and if you go to the Graduate Division page, it's in the, the funding tab and you sort of click around until you get to it. I will um, put that link, this link in the chat later. Um, Current graduate students complete an application through this link. Incoming students, you would complete the FLOSS essay as part of your application to Berkeley. And if you have questions about that, you should reach out to your graduate um, advisor who's helping you with the application process and they can tell you about it. The letters of recommendation, your transcripts that you upload into your Berkeley application will be put into your FLOSS application. So it's all sort of connected in there. Current undergraduate students can complete the application through that link above. And if you apply for two competitions, you would submit two applications. So one for summer, one for academic year. And if there's any advisors here on this on this info session, 
we just want to highlight that the process for incoming graduate students is different than it has been in previous years. Departments don't, no longer have to recommend students, that all students are considered. Um, and if you're a GSAO and have questions about that, feel free to reach out to us. Do you want to add anything to that, Tomas? Um, I just think that before we go on to the next section, we should make sure that we get some of the questions that I'm seeing in okay. chat. Do you want? I. And we'll go through all this and. Uh, uh, do you want me to answer some of them? You cut out for a second. No, no, no. I, I, I just, I, I mean, I think they sh are, are questions. We questions. <laughs> just so we can do them all at once and not break up the presentation too much. Okay. Okay. I wonder if you should turn your video off because your audio is cutting in and out. Hmm. Me at least. Um, so I, should I continue, Thomas? Yes. Okay. Um, okay. Oh, and now I'm going to hand it over to Tomas to speak about the academic year. And just tell me when you want me to go to the next slide. Yeah. Um, well, first, I just wanted to address two of the questions we had first. Um, one of them is someone was asking if Arabic is eligible for FLOSS awards. And unfortunately, at the moment, it really is not because neither Middle Eastern studies nor African studies received funding uh, this cycle. Um, the only exception to this would be if you could potentially make some argument that your Arabic research related to one of the other area study centers, but you'd need to talk to that specific center and make a very strong case as to why it related to, for example, European studies, or I don't even know what else would be, maybe something in South Asian studies. I don't know where else you could make an argument that Arabic is relevant. Um, the other person was um, asking how we would demonstrate intermediate or advanced proficiency if you've never taken coursework in those languages. And this is also a recurrent question. Um, for people who don't have formal language training, it can be a little tricky. Generally, and correct me if I'm wrong, Julie, and other people, the centers don't ask for any sort of testing in advance. The um, level of your FLOSS award is determined by the class that you say you're going to enroll in during the period of your fellowship. So you are considered an intermediate student if you're enrolled in intermediate classes, essentially. Um, for your own benefit, you may want to make sure beforehand, uh, before enrolling, that you are actually at that level so that we don't have any issues later on. But uh, that is something you should probably talk to the language department to see if you can get some sort of assessment done. All right, I guess we should go on to the next slide and talk about what Tomas, the academic... There's, there's yes. a question in the Q&A. If mm -hmm. you click the Q&A button. Another uh, question? Yes. Uh, are upcoming fall 2024 graduate students eligible for summer 2024 grants? Um, <laughs> this is also a somewhat complicated question. I would say that not easily. One of the problems with not being an uh, enrolled graduate student during summer 2024, um, if you're coming in in the fall, is that there isn't any mechanism for us to pay you the award because we can only pay these awards out to enrolled graduate students. So I believe some centers have done this before. I don't think it's necessarily recommended, but the main drawback for even considering this is that the center probably wouldn't be able to pay you until September for whatever coursework you are taking in the summer. Um, are any of you actually offering awards to incoming graduate students for the summer? No, students, students let's just have, say it's not possible. Students have to be enrolled um, mm -hmm. at a FLAS granting institution. So that is a that is requirement from the U.S. Department of Education. That's not even the Berkeley thing. That's a U.S. Department of Education mm -hmm. thing. So um, if, they were, if they were enrolled in Berkeley summer sessions, that would that would count. Yes, count. So if you want to get a FLOSS award, you could do summer sessions, I guess. <laughs> All right, um, let's talk about the details of the academic year award before we get into summer. 
So um, the Academic Year Floss Award is, as Julia mentioned, the more standard award, um, which uh, is essentially what this award is originally um, created for. Um, it's to study language and area studies. So um, in order to support this, graduate students, as you can see, get a pretty good uh, amount of money in order to cover your uh, institutional fees and uh, payments, as well as a decent stipend. For undergraduates, it's not... Uh, quite so high, um, but still a decent amount of money. Although with undergraduates, uh, there can be some complications about how these awards can affect their overall Berkeley aid package. So as in all things financial related, it pays to get the advice of somebody who is familiar with your specific situation for accepting any money. We move on to the next one, I guess. Um, here is just a list of eligible languages. Um, As you can see, they are of pre-approved languages. You don't need to get special um, a special exemption from the Department of Education to study. They have already been cleared, and so there is no um, particular complication to them. But at the same time, this is not the definitive list of languages and that falls into one of these uh, regions. Um, the center and myself will be happy to work with you to get a Department of Education approval for a one-time exemption for you to study that language. In general, that uh, requires a bit more legwork. You have to show a reasonable plan that uh, about how you're going to study the language, as well as um, a few other uh, administrative details. But uh, as you can see, we already have a pretty uh, robust list that covers, I think, most of the languages people would want to study, excepting Arabic. Um, next slide. Oh, this is actually an excellent uh, question from uh, the chat. Uh, the funding that was shown on the previous slide is uh, per year. So the Floss Award in general is about uh, $38,000 for graduate students uh, per year fall and uh, spring and uh, 15,000 for undergrads. Uh, we tend to distribute that half and half. Um, if there are some particular reasons why you need a different distribution, that, but in general, it's half per semester. Tomas? All right, you can go back. Uh, yes. Tomas, I would just also note that not all- Yes, Dylan. Centers, uh, not all centers offer um, undergraduate awards. So it's important to check oh. uh, with the centers to make sure like East Asian studies, we do not offer undergraduate FLAS awards. So be sure to check before you apply oh. for undergrads. Are you the only one who doesn't? Is there anybody else who doesn't un offer undergrad awards? All right. I guess, uh, so if you're in East Asian studies and you're an undergrad, you are out of luck, unfortunately, but everyone else I think is uh, welcome to apply. Um, so in terms of uh, lower priority languages, uh, because this is also a question, uh, students who are taking uh, any level of Spanish, French, and German are essentially automatically given lower priority than what is referred to as less commonly taught languages. And this is especially true at beginning level, Spanish, French, or German. Uh, something that, as Julia said, should have been on this slide, but is not, is that undergrads are not allowed to receive beginning uh, language awards in any language whatsoever. So again, very sorry, but if you're an undergrad who is applying for a beginning level, you will have to wait until you have already got some experience with the language and try again later. Um, Students who have lower financial need, as documented on their FAFSA, also receive lower priority, as this is uh, you know, intended to benefit people who might otherwise not be able to undertake the language study. And then each center has its own specific priorities, um, which you should consult with uh, the center on their own website or directly by asking them. Uh, next slide, please. Um, I see there's a question in the chat, uh, whether it's common for graduate students to apply for beginner language levels. And uh, I would say that, yes, it is uh, common. Um, 
Yeah, I think I'm not sure whether centers would necessarily count being a beginner in a in an absolute sense as being a lower priority and a combination factors including which language you're intending to study. So, for example, if you were a beginner in a fairly obscure language, but um, Yes, there are always uh, uh, graduate students applying for beginners. It does have to get special approval from the Department of Education, though. And uh, in terms of requirements, beginning language study, you have to show that you have advanced proficiency in another language from the same area. So um, whatever specific, um, well, there's another example, for example, in uh, somebody here who's suggesting to study beginning Irish, having advanced proficiency in Spanish and German would qualify you to study beginning Irish because you have the uh, sufficient uh, ability in another Western European language. But I cannot answer specific questions about what priority your individual language would receive. That's a question that you have to ask the center directly, and it's probably not quite so uh, straightforward as long as it's not Spanish, French, and German, which again are lower priority languages. Anyway, <laughs> on to requirements. So um, the requirements for the AY fellows are a bit more um, intensive than for uh, summer awards. You must enroll each semester in one language class and one area studies class, um, preferably both at Berkeley, although, well, not to complicate things, there are other options for people whose languages are not taught at Berkeley, but um, each course must be taken for credit and a letter grade. Uh, now, as Julia also mentioned earlier, there is a dissertation reading and a research and writing class option for graduate students, which as far as I know, all centers offer. Again, if you don't offer it, please uh, notify me, um, which is for students who uh, will are using a foreign language essentially integrally to writing uh, their dissertation. This particular award does not have any language or area studies class requirements, um, but it does require exceptional approval from the Department of Education. Um, so again, there's a little bit more work that has to go into getting approved for this for each student. Um, all right, I see I have a question about what area studies courses are. So area studies courses is a very broad category that essentially qualifies anything that has to do with the culture, history, politics, language, uh, essentially anything that has to do with the related to the language that you're studying. So for example, this person is asking about literature courses. If you're studying Russian and you want to take a Russian literature course to fulfill your area studies requirement, that should qualify. You know, same thing if you wanted to take Russian uh, one place that it doesn't really work is if the area studies course does not overtly relate to the language you're studying. For example, we previously have had a student who was taking, uh, I believe it was either Danish or Swedish, who was applying to use an area studies course that studied German um, decadent literature. And that received some pushback from the Department of Education because there was not an obvious connection why a student who's taking, let's say, Swedish would, why an area studies course in German relates to that. Um, all right. Uh, does the area studies course have to be graduate level? No, I don't believe it does. Is that correct, uh, Jeff? There's, yeah, there's really no requirement by center. I mean, every center would be different, but really there's no um, requirement that it be a graduate level course. It just needs to be something that you can that you would be eligible to take within your degree program. Sounds good. Anyway, so um, in on top of the um, actual course requirements, there are a few minor administrative requirements for the academic year award: online pre-assessment and post-assessment by your language instructor. Now, who actually does this assessment can vary a bit. Generally, we recommend uh, the fall language instructor just because you'll be working with them. And so you don't have to find somebody else. But uh, the thing to consider is that it does need to be the same person doing both your pre-course language assessment in the fall and your post-course language assessment in the summer 
uh, or following the spring term rather. So um, you want to make sure that it's somebody that you would feel comfortable going back to later on and asking them to assess your language ability again. And this is a very simple assessment. It's essentially a battery of yes or no questions asking things along the lines of, does this person know how to order a coffee? To does, can this person express complex thoughts in the foreign language they're studying? You also need to do a self-report at the end of the term where you will report all the classes you've taken for this fellowship. People often put in all the classes they've taken across the whole, uh, you know, of their university career, but you really just need to put the ones that are relevant to the actual fellowship. Um, and that these are all done through an online system that you will receive email notifications to complete. And then there is also a tracking survey that the Department of Education sends out, which you should be ready to fill out or uh, they will be very cross with you. Um, I see there's a question about whether you need to mention the assessment plans in the application. No, you don't, because everybody needs to do an assessment and the person who does it is somewhat uh, immaterial. So it's not that hard to find somebody to do the assessment. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a question that we often get is whether students can receive multiple FLOSS awards and, uh, well, they can receive <laughs> multiple years worth of FLOSS awards. You can't accept more than one for any specific term, but uh, certainly, uh, and uh, again, if anybody does, if anybody's center doesn't do this, please correct me, but uh, all the centers I've worked with have multiple repeating and return students who will continue to expand and deepen their language uh, ability over the course of several years worth of FLOSS awards. So I completely uh, encourage you to apply for this, even if you have already done so before, and to apply again if you do this year. You can also receive um, separate summer and academic year awards, but they are separate applications. Getting one does not guarantee you get the other and they do have different requirements as I will get to later in this presentation. Uh, you should confirm um, with your FLOSS Center at uh, or the language program whether they will actually be offering your language at the necessary um, level at Berkeley during the term of your award. So um, this often is the case, uh, an issue for people who are studying FLOSS at higher uh, advanced language levels that Berkeley may offer introductory or intermediate. But if you want to take advanced, we'll need to look at other options. Again, if you have to take your language course outside of Berkeley, that is a possibility, but it is uh, does require a bit more administrative work. So maybe if, if there's particular interest from somebody in that, I'll address it at the end when we have an open Q&A. Um, <clears throat> next slide, please. Um, Julia, can you cover this? Actually, I'm just, my throat's getting a little bit scratchy. I just wanted to take a rest yeah, for a second. Get a drink of water. Yes. <laughs> application requirements, the application form, statement of purpose. Um, that is why you're interested in studying this language and this area, this region of the world. I encourage students to explain um, how it fits into their academic and professional goals, why this is really essential for you to achieve your goals. Um, two letters of recommendation. Uh, ideally, they should be from someone who can speak to your experience with the language or with that world region, but that's not always possible. So do the best you can. Um, and the transcripts, graduate students are entered in the fall should include a copy of their undergraduate transcript so we just so the committee has more information to look at and the FAFSA. Um, for the academic year awards are announced in June or July of 2024. Um, so that is sort of a quick turnaround to figure out your plan. Um, you find out information June or July, and then that's applied in August, right, when the when the semester starts. And that is out of our hands. I think it's a pain point in the process, and it's really just dependent on the Department of Education and the federal funding cycles that we have absolutely no control over. So uh, we are going to do everything we can to get you the information as quickly as possible. Anything to add, Tomas? I hope that sounds... Sounds to throw to me. At this point, is there anybody who has a as yet unanswered question specifically relating to um, 
the uh, I see Pavel has uh, your hand up. Um, I can go ahead and unmute you, or you could just just unmute. Hello. Uh, so I'm applying for a grad school program that has a due date of January 6th. And so I'm planning to finish my class application by then. However, I know that I need to submit my FAFSA for this upcoming uh, school year that I'm applying for, but it's still taking a long time to open. Seems that even going to open until December 31st. And I don't know if I'm going to have enough time to meet the deadline that I need for my grad school application. So uh, would it be okay if I directly send the department that I'm applying for the PATSA uh, information a few days after I submit my grad school application? I can answer. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah, you can submit your FAFSA. And for, I mean, this happens every year that there are people who can't get in their FAFSA by the deadline for whatever reason, and I'll just upload them directly to the application. So you can okay. send that to... Uh, I guess me or me, I would be the person to send it to. <laughs> um, all right. I see we have a question of, um, well, summer fellowships we'll get into shortly. Uh, yes. If you have, there's a question that if somebody has um, financial assistance to cover tuition, are they still eligible to apply? And yes, you are still eligible. Um, the one thing that I suppose I should have mentioned when I was discussing the difference between stipend and tuition payments uh, is that if you get the award, you are guaranteed the stipend. However, the tuition portion, which is the um, $18,000 for graduate students, is only paid up to actual need. So if you have another fellowship that covers um, your tuition, you will not receive that money. It's that uh, simple. So, um, yeah, if you want to bring it up there, you can see $20,000 stipend that is guaranteed for all graduate students who receive the award, but the tuition and fees portion, again, only up to what your actual need and expenses at Berkeley is. And that covers both, um, you know, regular Berkeley tuition uh, program fees for the professional programs, out of state expenses. Uh, I don't even, I can't even think of what else graduate students are charged for. There's so many things, but any of that can be covered with the tuition and fees portion. The other thing that can be covered by tuition and fees is if you need to take classes outside of Berkeley to fulfill one of your requirements, that can also be applied towards that. Um, for undergraduates, this isn't usually an issue since I don't think I've ever seen an undergraduate who had uh, not needed at least some portion of the uh, tuition and fees, but I suppose the same principle applies there. <clears throat> Now, the, this person has asked whether they submitted a graduate school application which had applications questions about floss on the application. Do they need to submit a separate application as well? Um, I, I, what, actually, I'm sure, Julie, that they're the same, but more effectively. You should you should reach out to your graduate advisor in your department and let them know that you want to apply for floss and they can help you do it. Whether it's like you write your statement separately and send it to them and they'll add it to your application. I don't know the exact process, but they can help you with that. Um, okay, lots of questions. Um, uh, there's a question as to whether floss or other fellowships would be applied first. Um, this is complicated and slightly beyond my understanding. There is a formula that the graduate division uses to apply fellowships. If you have um, a department fellowship, for example, um, I would recommend talking to your advisor to see whether you can use the floss money instead of your department's fellowship, um, just because it saves the department's money and otherwise we will not spend the money that we have. So um, that is certainly something that we can discuss, but it's very individual, so I can't give a blanket answer there. Uh, the next question is related to some rewards, so I will skip that for now. Um, a person asks what the dissertation floss fellowship requires and implies. 
yes, I would reach out to the individual centers to see both that they would consider a dissertation award um, in terms of actual requirements as a regular AY floss does, but it does need to be approved by the Department of Education, in which case you'll need to submit uh, just a lot of information essentially about your research. Um, uh, a person has asked whether only you can only take language classes at certain institutions or if private lessons can also be covered and allowed. Uh, yes, private lessons can be covered and allowed, although I don't necessarily recommend them unless you don't have another option, both because they tend to be more expensive and also because they require a lot more administrative work. Um, if you are doing private lessons, you have to get approval from the Department of Education uh, and you have to submit essentially a syllabus, a CV, and a bibliography, a bunch of other, essentially what you would need if you were, the sort of materials you'd get if you were taking a regular class, you need to submit it to the Department of Education for them to review and make sure that you're, you know, not just paying your buddy who has no pedagogical knowledge. But um, yes, private lessons are allowed, and in fact, they are often required for some of the uh, more obscure languages people want to study. All right, how many students do departments typically award? Um, this depends very much on the center, so it's uh, a little bit complicated to answer. I'm not even gonna try. <laughs> Enough, <laughs> several for each center. Um, uh, all right, I think we can move forward. I think that was all of the questions. Summer awards, which uh, seems like there was quite a bit of uh, excitement about. This is a very nice picture, by the way. Uh, next slide. This is where I did my floss in Brazil. Oh, I was, for some reason, assuming it was at Columbia. But anyway, uh, so uh, for summer floss awards, um, graduate and undergraduate uh, payouts are exactly the same. $5,000 towards tuition and program fees and a $3,500 stipend. Now, to answer that question that was hanging out in the chat, applicants have to be enrolled in Berkeley. Uh, this language is a little bit imprecise. They have to be enrolled in Berkeley for the duration of the summer award, which means that if you are graduating in May 2024, you are not eligible for a summer 2024 award. If you are a student who plans to graduate in May 2024, what I would recommend if you're interested in applying for this is that you push your graduation date back to the end of the summer. You can talk to your advisor about doing that and whether that's a good idea for you. I don't think there's any particular consequence to it, but uh, that is the only way that you would qualify for a summer 2024 award if you would otherwise graduate in May. Summer fellowships are a bit more exciting in some way than the academic year fellowships, because while you can use them on campus or for other US programs, many people choose to use them to go study language abroad. And uh, so this is a great opportunity both to learn a language and have that you know real immersion experience where you have a constant usage of the language. Um, it is intended to support intensive language study though, um, which means that the courses have to be, uh, they have to meet certain language and time requirements. So it's a six weeks and actually this may be on a future slide. So I'll hold off on that for a second. But the main point is that it does have to be a language class. You cannot use this to do research. There is no dissertation research option for the summer awards, only language study. The one, one thing that's a little bit nice about the summer awards though, is that there is not an area studies course requirement. We can go on to the next slide, Julia. All right, I thought this was the next slide. So for intensive, the language course has to be equivalent to one academic year's worth of study, which uh, means that it has to be at least six weeks in duration and uh, at the beginning and intermediate level, at least 140 hours of direct classroom instruction face-to-face -face with the uh, instructor. Um, Advanced students get a little bit of a reprieve of this. They only have to do 120 hours of uh, classroom instruction. Uh, now, often we'll have an issue where students uh, apply for programs that don't meet these requirements. 
luckily for them, you can meet these requirements by combining different programs. So for example, if you want to take a program that is six weeks in duration, but it's only 120 hours and you're at the beginning level, you can make up those extra 20 hours through private tutoring, for example, or, or through another sort of class. Um, and in fact, sometimes we'll have students who depends on your specific situation. Um, in general, I do recommend um, trying to find a program that meets all of these requirements in one go, but don't feel limited by that if it doesn't best meet your particular academic goals. <clears throat> As I pointed out for um, the academic year awards, private tutoring uh, does require the approval by the Department of Education, syllabus and CV, which I will be happy to assist you in doing. Note uh, also, though, that any overseas program also requires Department of Education approval. It's not particularly difficult if it's a reputable program with a reasonable presence where you can go on and check, you know, that they have an actual physical location and accredited teachers. Um, but nonetheless, uh, anything that is not at an accredited U.S. institution needs to be approved by the Department of Education. Sorry. All right. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and again, languages eligible for the summer are, as far as I know, exactly the same as the languages eligible for the academic year. Same centers. So we might as well just go to the next slide. Um, this is just a list of some different summer language options. Of course, Berkeley summer sessions are always an option. And this actually is an option for people, uh, whether or not you're actually enrolled at Berkeley, because by enrolling in summer sessions, you are... <laughs> an enrolled Berkeley student. So that person who was graduating in May, the other option, I suppose, besides pushing a graduation date back would be to enroll in uh, Berkeley summer sessions for your FLOSS award. Come on, um, I may. And uh, yes, related yeah. to this. Um, so for those, um, mm -hmm. you know, we discussed Arabic in the future or in the past, I don't know if they're still on, but for those students who are interested in studying Arabic during the summer, there are language programs, and I'll put three of them in the chat, which have their own FLAS funding to which you can apply. And actually, many of these many of these organizations or many of these summer programs on this list here have their own FLAS funding to which you, even as a Berkeley student, are eligible to apply for. So um, keep in mind that even um, like for the case of Arabic, if, even though it's not offered here or we don't have FLAS during the academic. Um, we don't have our own FLAS fellowships. You can apply for FLAS fellowships um, at other institutions that are, or for FLAS fellowships from other institutions. And I'll put those for Arabic in the chat. Great point, Jeff. And also so, I want to highlight for the Latin American and Caribbean, there's Nahuatl and Haitian and the Haitian Creole, and those are both at FLAS granting institutions. So it's possible to get FLAS through them as well. Uh, good point. So um, U.S. INS programs are easier in the sense that they are, we are able to approve them just by looking at them, seeing they're a U.S. <laughs> based university. Um, so let's consider them to be pre-approved in a certain sense. Overseas programs are not the same way. We do have to do more vetting again to make sure that this isn't some fly by night operation. Um, and so if you are planning to go overseas, we will be in more uh, direct contact, making sure that you are going somewhere that is uh, safe, that you're going somewhere that is academically rigorous. Um, we will talk uh, about it. <clears throat> uh, I guess we can go to the next slide. Um, now, that being said, you don't need to stress too much about finding a perfect language program now because we will not actually confirm your language program until after the award has been offered. It's a lot of work to go and approve a language program and then you don't actually get the award, right? Um, so you will need to provide essentially all of this information to us before we are able to process the award completely in terms of getting paid out and making approvals for some of the other uh, payments. Uh, Julia, I can't remember, do we have a slide on travel funding on here? We do, all right, I'll talk about that in a minute. 
But uh, regardless, I do suggest you get all of this information together as early as possible, because while there are always chances that there will be some last minute, especially for overseas programs, some last minute issue will come up that uh, makes it implausible or unsafe for you to travel. Uh, getting these approvals in advance will save you a lot of stress and save us a lot of work on the back end. So um, all of the centers will be happy to also recommend programs if you have any uh, particular questions about what's most uh, appropriate or effective for you. Next slide, please. All right. So um, one of the other things for students who are not choosing to stay at Berkeley for um, their summer programs is that the Floss Centers, I believe all of them, please again, correct me if I'm wrong, um, offer travel grants to help uh, cover the expense of attending a program either elsewhere in the United States or abroad of up to $1,000, as you can see here. Again, this is money that is up to the actual need. So you will not just get a blank check for $1,000. You have to show that the price of your flight is up to the amount that you're asking for. Um, <clears throat> uh, one qualification for the travel uh, awards is that your flight must comply with the Fly American Act or um, Open Skies Agreement, which essentially means that your flight has to be booked through an American carrier. There are some exceptions, mostly in the European Union to this rule, and there are some other more complicated exceptions if you're going to a place that doesn't isn't serviced by American carriers. But uh, for most people, easiest way to think about this is just book an American airline, um, if possible. Uh, you should not make travel in advancements in advance if you want a travel award. And uh, <laughs> This is, uh, well, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that phrasing. To get a travel award, it has to be approved at least 30 days before the date of your actual travel. So there is a chance, I, I don't think I've ever had a travel award get rejected, but there is a chance if you are counting on this, that your award may be rejected and you'll be out of pocket for the money. So it's a balancing act between when you want to actually buy the ticket to the flight or when you know you are sure you'll have enough funding to cover this if you want to make sure that that's actually approved before purchasing so again all of this to say starting this process early is really guaranteed for everyone's peace of mind um, one thing that was pointed out on here that uh, we have had a couple of issues with in the past is that if you get a travel award it has to be directly to and from the program. You can't spend uh, extra time, you know, traveling around the country and then come back. You can't go from the United States to your program and then go to a third country afterward and returning to the United States with no detours. If you have some interest in doing one of these, you know, staying on in a foreign country or going to a third place, you can always apply to cover just the trip to your program, but um, you cannot uh, arrange your <laughs> study travel with uh, personal time, essentially. Now, of course, none of this, if you're not asking for money, none of this is relevant and you can fly however you like on whichever airline you like. Um, Floss applicants should be prepared to be flexible if they cannot travel for the they propose for Floss. So, of course, this was something of an issue in 2020, but it does occasionally happen that other circumstances will conspire in a country that a student was planning to visit where they are no longer able to travel there. Um, so in those cases, you should flexibility to either have an alternative program, an alternative overseas program waiting in the wings or to do a US or a virtual program even. We uh, don't encourage virtual programs necessarily, but they can be approved given they meet more or less the same criteria as a regular summer program and are synchronous. That's the word of the day. They have to be live in most circumstances. <laughs> um, students can propose study overseas, yes. Um, so I guess this one for programs 
fees is that they have to cover direct educational expenses. It would be essentially the equivalent of Berkeley's tuition and student fees for the program. So your program fees cannot go towards lodging, food, um, other miscellaneous expenses that you may incur while abroad. Um, unless they're all bundled together in such a way that they cannot be disentangled, but I have not yet encountered that uh, experience. Um, so just like with the Berkeley tuition, the program fees for the summer award are up to actual expenses. So if you don't use all of the $5,000, you will not receive, if you don't need all the $5,000, you will not receive the full $5,000. You will only receive the amount that your program is actually charging. But you will receive the full stipend. <clears throat> all right, uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, Again, Julia, maybe you can cover this. <laughs> I've been talking a lot. Yes, application requirements for the summer floss is similar because it's the same form online. The application, the statement of purpose, two letters of recommendation, transcripts. The difference here is the language program information. So as Tomas said, it doesn't have to be finalized, but we do want to know that you've done the work, that you know, have an idea of what you're, how you're going to learn this language, where you're going to study it, what the program is, how many hours, that sort of thing. I think it makes applications much stronger to show that you've, you know, that you have an idea of what you want to get into. Um, and the FAFSA. Um, and again, if I think it's important to show that the that the program that you are proposing fulfills the requirements for the number of hours, and if it doesn't, that you can show your plan for how you will fulfill those hours, and also an idea of the dates that you want to be studying the language in the summer. And again, this isn't required, but it makes your application stronger to show that you've done your research about it. And awards will be announced in April 2024. It is sooner because you have to be able to make your plans for the summer. I think we can go to the next slide. Yeah. Oh, dear. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, the requirements for the summer fellowship in terms of the administrative reporting are essentially the same as the academic year award. You have to do a pre-assessment and post-assessment by your language instructor. For this one, we do recommend you use the instructor at your program in uh, where you will be studying most, well, I don't know if most, but a good deal, a good number of these programs are familiar with having floss students. So some of them may prefer to have a single individual, for example, do all of the floss require, uh, all the floss evaluations for the students who are receiving that award. So I would check in with your summer program to see how they would like to handle this. Um, <clears throat> uh, there's also the same self-report at the end where you'll report what you did over the summer. Very simple, just essentially what the class was you took. And then the same survey will continue on for a few years. There's a question in the Q&A about the letters of recommendation oh. that I'm, Gina, I think you're somewhere in the Zoom. Could you respond to that. The question is the the Floss grad website says that only one letter is needed for summer, not two. And I had said two um, on my presentation. So Gina will answer that soon. She did she did answer. She says one is needed for the summer application. Okay. Great. We'll update the PowerPoint for next year. <laughs> yes. This is a Quechua class. Okay. How is it? Really? That happens when I'm the one who gets to design the PowerPoint. <laughs> I know we're all very Latin America heavy here. Yeah. Um, so more information again: the Graduate Division Floss website and the link to the application. This is the steps for how to get there because you can't copy and paste a link off of a Zoom screen. Um, you go to financial support, fellowships, and then you scroll down to online application. Um, and contact information. So Tomas is the FLAS coordinator for Berkeley and he manages most of the centers, but not all of them. So if you are interested in a language that's covered by East Asian studies and you would communicate with Dylan Davis, 
if you're interested in a Southeast Asian language with Alexandra Del Ferro and at the Slavic Eastern European or Eurasian language with Jeff Pennington and all other languages, you can communicate directly with Tomas with any questions. And if he needs to forward your question to a center, uh, for example, to me, he will. Um, and one thing that Tomas is not always, it's not in his realm to answer is a lot of the financial questions because that is handled by graduate division or by your department. And so he can coordinate with graduate division or with your advisor, but um, you also can speak directly with your department about financial questions like the question of, I have this fellowship and I want floss, how will they play together? That is something you should speak directly with your with your advisor or with financial aid about. The other question that I won't be able to easily or correctly answer is if you have center specific questions as to what the review committees are looking for in your awards. That is a question that you should direct to the specific center because I do not know the review committee. So I don't have any insight into their workings. <clears throat> And to answer a question from the chat, is that the same website for undergrad FLOSS applications? Yes, all the FLOSS is managed through graduate division for graduate students or undergraduate students. Welcome to Berkeley bureaucracy. <laughs> and we appreciate the work graduate division does. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> okay, this is our last slide. So. If you have a question that has not yet been answered, please feel free to chat it. Otherwise, we will let you go because we're exactly at the hour. All right, then. Thank you all for attending. If you need to review this session, you can uh, do so on the Clocks YouTube channel, I understand. We'll have it up in about a week or 10 days, and I will also send it out to everyone who, I think I'll have everyone's email addresses who attended, so I can send it to all of you if I if Zoom gives me a list. If not, just remember to check. All right. Thank you all and have a good day.